Chats, chats, chats with Leah. Hats, hats, hats. What are you saying then? Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Chats with Leah Hats. I'm really excited to share this episode with Brogan Tate, who, if you're not already aware, is a content creator online. She's been creating content for over 10 years, and she was also the Cosmopolitan Influencer Choice Award winner back in 2018. She has worked with some huge brands like Disney, Visit England, M&S, Cineworld. She's totally on top of her game, and I really look up to her as a creator. So it was great to sit down with her. We chatted about loads of things such as managing yourself online, growth, reaching subscriber milestones, and also things like dealing with hate and trolls and bullying online. So it was really great to chat to her. I actually let her introduce herself in the episode, so we'll cut straight to that. Before we get going, I just thought it might be nice for anyone who doesn't know you already. Um, we could just sort of outline a little bit about what you do. I'm sure I've probably already said it in my intro. But um, yeah, do you want to chat a little bit about what it is you do? And then we'll go into the juicy stuff. The juicy, juicy. Um, so I am a digital content creator aka influencer if you're using our industry term i don't really love that so much but we'll dive into that and i've been making content online for the last 10 years would you believe i am old school so i started my channel when i was just 17 and i've been blogging a little bit on the side but mostly focusing on my youtube channel and i make videos about well lifestyle content and travel stuff so home travels, a lot of staycation videos recently, um, buying a house, getting a mortgage, all that kind of fun stuff. And my channel was very much literally following me in my life. Um, as vain as that sounds, that is the honest truth. Um, so yeah, that's my channel. And I don't think that's vain because, um, well, I guess I've, I'm in a bit of a similar situation to you in that I have a channel that is a personal channel and mm it's really hard to explain to people what a personal channel is because you're like, it's just basically me. And they're like, and why would anyone want to watch that? It's <laughs> my yeah. life. Um, yeah. But no, that's amazing. 10 years on the platform. That's actually, I saw your 10 year anniversary. I love that. That video, I basically did a montage of 10 years of clips and I went through almost every video I'd ever made and there were over 500 videos. It took me hours and hours and hours to edit it together, but it was such a joy seeing how much I'd grown as a person, how much my content had changed, the type of videos I used to make and all the achievements I've had along the way. And it was really nice to celebrate that because I've always felt like I'm quite a small creator actually. I have around 80,000 subscribers, so I've not hit that like 100,000 mark. And I do feel like there's some sort of thing in our little world that once you hit that, it's some sort of certain milestone that puts you on some sort of pedestal. And um, I've never quite got there. I've never had a viral video, but it is my full time job. And uh, and I love it so much. I'm so passionate about my channel. I honestly am so proud of all the content I put out, all the brands I get to work with. And it's definitely the best job I've ever had. So, yeah, I love I love it so much. It's such a joy. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't change it. And also just the whole like 100,000 thing. I do, if you really ask yourself, like, why do I want to reach that number? I don't know about you, but I think for me, it would be like, it's just a number. And it's just like a kind of, I don't know how much of your life would change. Like you'd probably be making a very similar amount financially than you make that as what you make now. And also brands, probably just the same brands and, and the same kind of brands you're working with. Nothing would really change in your life, but it's just be like that kind of like, oh, I hit it and I got a plaque or something. What do you think It's that, that play button. Yeah, it's yeah. the play button. I think if you're old school, it's just one of, one of those things that it's such a pride thing, a sense of achievement that you've hit that milestone. But I felt it when I hit 50,000 subscribers and I feel it every time I hit certain milestones. But I think subscriber count has sort of gone out the window over the last few years. And actually, on the flip side, being a smaller creator, I'm sort of put in that micro influencer category, which actually does me favours sometimes. So it wow. means that brands sometimes want to work with me because they have a smaller budget and they know that my reach is good, even though my subscribers are less. My views are really high. So mm. actually, all of that is a load of rubbish. It, really would yeah. only be for my own my own validation to be honest yeah. but um you know it's a goal and it's nice to have goals so one day one day yeah for sure I feel like you can't do more than what you're already doing now to get to that goal and I feel like when Joel and I hit a hundred over a hundred 
like when we hit 100,000, we didn't do anything different. And I truly, truly believe that it is in the hands of like the algorithm gods. I know that sounds ridiculous, I but I don't remember doing anything to get there. In fact, now it's like, oh God, we're stuck where we are and we're trying to sort of have lift off again. It's, it's totally out of your hands as a creator, if you're a creator listening, um, those milestones. You just got to keep creating, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, I I knew I was staying stuck. I didn't diversify my content when I should have. I didn't want to do clickbait and I didn't want to follow any major trends. I was very mm. happy in my little bubble with my little community. And I think as a creator now, you do have to get experimental. You have to try new things. You have to, you know, make a video you've never made before and test it with your audience and see if it's something that will take off. Because otherwise, if you just keep creating the same content every week, you just stay with the same amount of people that tune in. And that's lovely, but it's not how you grow. So I know mm. what I could have done to make me grow. I chose not to. So I used to actually make weekly vlogs and they were the backbone of my YouTube channel. I used to make them every Monday at six o'clock and I'd film it from a Monday to a Sunday and I'd edit yeah. the whole video and turn it around in, well, the Sunday night and the Monday morning to get it up that next day. And my audience loved it because it was such a like honest, raw, real vlog full of all the highs and lows, the crying, the emotions, you know, yeah. everything. And um, people were really invested and, and it was incredible. And that time in my YouTube journey was lovely. But when the pandemic hit, I found myself forced to stop weekly vlogging because there's only so much you can film when you're at home seven days a week uh, so I ended up having to pivot my channel quite quickly and yeah. I started going down the route of making more like home day in the lifestyle vlogs and even now some of the older school viewers of mine on my channel keep asking me are you bringing back the weekly vlogs and the reality is is not only are those old now for my channel I need to have new content but also it put more boundaries in place for me because I ended up oversharing a lot in those videos wow. I ended up T talking about things I probably should have kept to myself because I used my channel almost like an online diary and therapy at times because my audience was so small. I never received a lot of backlash and we were really like close, but that meant a lot of things for me. It meant I was sharing too much. I wasn't growing and I had to change. And the pandemic basically forced me to change, which has been really good for me. And I'm really proud of that. So yeah, I'm pleased that I've been able to sustain the same type of video, but in a slightly different way. And that's been a really good, good move for me, I think. Yeah, no, for sure. And when you were doing those weekly vlogs, was it during that time where you thought, oh, I should be diversifying, I should be doing clickbait, I should be trying to reach new people? Was it during those times where you had that routine that you thought, oh, I should probably digress, my, like diversify my content right now, but it wasn't until the pandemic hit that it made you actually change? Yeah, for sure. But also I am a bit of a creature of habit and I was scared of change. So I just sat in my little comfort zone. And so I was trying new videos outside of the weekly vlog. So it'd be like a weekly vlog and another video. I used to call it like a sit down video, you know? One oh yeah, I love them, just love them. Yeah, <laughs> sit, sit down, down and, and chat video. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, that's what I'd call it. But the reality is, is that I just, I, I just couldn't keep the weekly vlogs because they were, there were just too many things that weren't right anymore so mm -hmm. yeah they were good for me good for my channel but I knew I did know I did know deep down I, want, I needed to change um in order to grow in order to hit those goals so yeah it's been good it's good well done and, and I'm sure a lot of people I've heard them talk about a lot of OGs on YouTube say that they kind of reach an age or a time on YouTube where they realize they've actually done too much oversharing and they should have reined it in it's often the oversharing that allows them to reach people in the way that they do and to connect with audiences on that kind of like meaningful level. And then as soon as they sort of, you know, rein it in and they stop oversharing, audiences can sometimes feel um, abandoned or they can feel like you're not their friend anymore, if that makes sense. Like it's such a strange dynamic to watch somebody and then sort of they're like your online friend and then they stop giving you all the information. They just give you a little bit and you an audience can feel like betrayed in some way. Have you felt any mm. of that? I thought I would feel it more, but actually my audience were really respectful and understanding. I think considering the world as it was, it was sort of expected that I would take a step back a little bit and reassess. So I think that everyone has to be open to change. And I, that's my audience were really cool about it. And uh, 
I, I, st- I do have people that d- are quite demanding that want more from me. But most people just respect boundaries, you know, like I don't need to talk about everything all the time. You're still getting me. And I'm still I think there's a big uh, misconception that just because I pull back and share less doesn't mean that I'm any less real or honest or truthful when I need to be. I think it's just important for me as a creator to have almost a separate life on and offline. And that was sort of a big inspiration into why I started my podcast with my co-host Bianca. We called it the online offline because we established as people who were online in the online world that it is quite healthy actually to have things that you know are your online stuff and stuff that you do offline. Um, yes. And I, I've really enjoyed having that separation. And it does mean that sometimes you do get the split of like the broken tape that's online and then the brogan that you know in real life in person that my friends know but I still think that I show up and I'm myself and I try and be as entertaining and fun and positive and that's what you're always going to get on my channel no matter what the type of video is I'm always gonna you know try and be my true self and then I basically have used Instagram stories to be more chatty and in the moment and instant, like literally taking back that instant and Instagram sort of vibe. Um, <laughs> oh my god, so that's true. great. But that's that's exactly what I ended up doing. And so little things like I try and if I'm coming on stories and I'm showing my face, I won't use like a filter on my face because I think it's nicer for my audience to see me as I am. And I'll post photos that I literally have taken in that moment and edit it, caption. I don't care what time or what day it is. I don't care if it's going to have massive or no reach at all. But if I'm there, I publish and then I reply to the people that have commented. It just keeps this nice community. And I think that's that's ultimately what my channel is, is like it's full of good people, good vibes. And yeah. as long as I can keep that going, then that that's all that matters to me. Your community is so, so strong and so engaged. And um, I mean, earlier on, you said, you know, you're a sort of smaller influencer. I don't actually see you as a, a small channel. I, I feel oh, like you. I, in my head, you're like one of those kind of like, 500,000 like El Darby level like oh, in my stop. head you're, you're no you're like honestly not just saying this you're I I you're like there and I know that numbers shouldn't mean that but I see you on that kind of level because I think it's because of your community and because of how engaged they are and brands want to work with you again and again and again and it, it, you know it's obviously working your relationship with your audience is working they trust your recommendations and is there anything that you've kind of done over the years that's sort of made that happen or has it been natural thank you firstly that's super nice of you I do I am really proud of the people that come and support and show up and they're really lovely and loyal so I am very grateful for that and I never take that for granted because it's easy to forget as a creator that you know I wouldn't have a channel if people weren't watching that's ultimately what it is but at the same time a lot of it is my own hard work my own dedication my commitment to showing up I have never taken an extended break from my YouTube channel ever, even when I had full-time jobs. Um, You know, I've pulled back or not uploaded some weeks, of course, but there's always been videos, like always. And when I was going through my 10 years, I couldn't believe how much I'd actually made. But I think I just try and make videos that I want to watch, which is why I've sometimes steered away from clickbait and things like that because, or trends, because they're not necessarily videos that I watch. And I'm not saying they're not the right videos. There's a place and a, and a certain demographic and audience for those type of videos. But for me personally, I want to see people trying on everything in their wardrobe. I want to hear what, what are your favorite TV shows right now? I want to know you know, how to use the Dyson Airwrap because I just bought one. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? One. Like, I want that kind of content. And so yeah. I sometimes do struggle because I know I'm going to put out a video and I know it won't hit the same as some of my others. But I do it because I loved making it. I'm proud of it. And I know that my audience, at least some of them, will enjoy it too. And so I think because I create a nice mix of content, there's always a bit of something for everyone. It's been a journey, but I think I've I've been honest in sharing a lot of stuff that's happened along the way and people have seen me grow through that. And that's that's been a big part of keeping that connection um, because I'm not afraid to say, hey, I'm struggling or actually I have to pull back here. Um, like even recently, I got some therapy for the first time and I didn't talk about it until I was ready, like months later. And I did it on our podcast in a place that I felt like it was more appropriate. And so if you know, you know, kind of thing, you know, yeah. if you want more from me, then you can, there's a little bit for something for everyone, yeah. if that yeah. makes sense. No, yeah. for sure. 
Um, I loved that episode on um, therapy on the podcast. And uh, it actually made me have a word with my dad because my dad's one of those people who goes, um, you've got nothing to be sad about. Your life's fantastic. People wish they had your life. And I'm like, doesn't really work like that, dad, but okay. <laughs> I think you guys had a great episode of sort of educating people and sharing your experiences and being like, don't let's not be afraid to talk about the fact that everything in your life might seem okay, but you might actually just be sad. And that was really comforting to hear. And I, I think that podcast, if anyone's not already listened to the online the online, offline. I'm like, offline, online, online, offline. I know. They're so similar. Yeah, it's online, offline. <laughs> the online, yeah. offline podcast. Yeah. And, um, you know, I will obviously link it up in the show notes because there's some amazing episodes and just the kind of stuff you want to listen to. I want to listen to two friends have a chat. I'm interested in that kind of content. So, um, yeah, that really does... Um, that is nice to hear because that's kind of what every creator wants to do, but they're too scared to do in some ways. They're like... Mm. I really want to make this, but it wouldn't get as many views as if I go and do that. So, yeah, you know, kudos to you for sort of like having that like dedication to what be you, be true kind of thing. Yeah, I literally wrote in my Instagram bio recently, like you do you, because I really just feel really passionately about following your own intuition and making videos that you are proud of and happy with. And I think in the 10 years I've been online, along the way, I've seen a lot of people like, be a sheep, follow the crowd, do videos that they think they should be making. And then they lose the passion for it and wonder why. If you're constantly chasing views and subscribers and you lose the love for the foundations of making a video, then you won't grow. And it doesn't matter how long you've been on YouTube, how much knowledge you have. The Mm -hmm. ultimate baseline of it is you've got to enjoy it because people will tell and you you have to get that nailed down first so if I'm struggling and I need to pull back I'd much rather put out quality content than quantity I'd rather say do you know I I can only do one video a week at the moment and Mm. but there are going to be four really solid videos that people are going to really love rather than trying to push out eight videos and know that that's going to help boost xyz so yeah it's, it's definitely been a learning curve but I actually invested in a coach and I know you know Laura but Laura is my um I don't know what how to describe her, but she's sort of like my influencer, business manager, coach. Yes. <laughs> it's the yeah. only way to describe her. So um, I basically went down the route of having management at one point, And mm. I could honestly do a whole episode on management and pros and cons and why they work for some creators and not for others. But yeah. I made quite a um, pivotal decision in letting go of mine and in order to grow financially because they were taking a 20% cut of everything I was earning. And so Mm. I recognized that I could do a lot of the work that they were doing. And so I took it all on myself. But the one area I was struggling was sort of trying to get that um, content ideas down and strategy. And I never looked at the insights or the analytics. I never knew what videos were performing better than others or where to place ads and how to make my thumbnails better. And all of this was just a blur to me. And uh, I, Laura and I started working together a year ago, over a year ago now. And we do like a monthly call and we spend four hours and we go through everything. And honestly, it's been a massive game changer for me as a creator, having someone there on my team who guides me and having her perspective has just been so refreshing. So without her, I certainly wouldn't have got through the last year um, because I had, I lost direction. I didn't know what I was doing or where I was going anymore. I just knew I wanted to make it my job and and keep, (laughs) keep making videos. That's all I knew. Um, And sometimes the nitty gritty of that is, uh, is hard. It's hard. Creators don't talk about it. Yeah. People don't talk about it. And yeah, it was you that introduced um, Joel and me to Laura. I think you'd mentioned her on a, on a, oh, sorry. Who did I say? Maura? Did I say Maura? Sorry. No, you said Laura. Okay. Um, So yeah, you introduced um, me to Laura and then I sort of said to Joel, should we do some calls with Laura? And it has been an absolute game changer. She's amazing. She's also very, very positive. And I feel like as creators, we can all get into a bit of a negative frame of mind sometimes. And you come off a call with Laura, you feel energized, you feel um, determined, like driven in in, in such a like, it's such a hype. You're like, yeah, Yeah. I can do this. Like, let's go do it. And then you go and then you go and do your homework that she, I kind of call it homework in my head. I'm like, right, Laura told me to do that. I've got to go do that. Thanks so much, obviously, for introducing me to Laura. And I think, 
yeah, if Laura's listening to this, then um, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's um, she's so in demand now. She's working with some of the best UK creators out there, and uh, rightly so because she is fab. But it, I think it's important to just note that you don't have to do what everyone else is doing and I think for a while I was so hung up on having management in order to grow and that I needed to be signed by someone and Mm. actually not having management has been the best thing for me and that's not to say that you know if the right opportunity came up or the right person or the right company you know I would never like turn down anything that I thought would be best for me but Mm. the point is is that I didn't look outside of what else is there because I was so hung up on, well, she's doing that and they're doing that. And so you have to just sort of stay in your own lane. And that's also why I um, don't have loads of creator friends because I quite like to keep it close knit. And I'm sure you feel the same. I know you've got your like core people that you just rely on um, to be able to trust and to be able to get that advice from. And it is a really, really difficult space to navigate sometimes yeah you're like the you are the best person for talking about self-management when I was going through a phase where I was thinking I might I think I want to leave my management I'm quite a small creator on my own um outside Mm. of my main channel um Joel and Leah and I I called you and I said this is what I'm thinking da 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 and I I felt like you know what this is possible for me and you're a really good person to talk to because you take responsibility, you take full responsibility, you go out and find, you know, build your contact, build your network. You do the work and you reap the rewards. And I feel like if you don't get any jobs that month, you know, it's only, you, you've only got yourself really to look at because you go, did I go reach out to many people this month? Did I send many emails? Did I go and reach out to that client I worked with two months ago and see if they want to do something again? Um, mm-hmm. So I feel like, yeah, you're amazing at sort of like staying in your lane and also inspiring others. I feel very inspired by you because I've sort of done that. And yeah, okay, I had a few quiet months during COVID and spoke to Laura. She was like, don't give yourself a hard time and et cetera. But um, yeah, no, you're definitely one for like self-managed, do it yourself. Like you've got this kind of thing. So, and the other thing I was going to (laughs) say, no, no. Uh, The other thing was, I think you were talking about... um, not just self-management, having loads of other creator friends and having a handful handful of friends. I'm totally on, on that wavelength with you. I know plenty of creators I know of, not necessarily know them, like, you know, wouldn't call them if... I wouldn't necessarily call many people if I had a problem. There's like a few, yeah. a few of us that I'd go, I, I trust that person, actually. Let me just see if um, the rates that I'm being offered by this brand are completely ridiculous. I'm going to go call that person who... Do you know what I mean? A few that I trust... Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of it is to do with um, having like an abundance mindset. So there's some people out there that think if you're doing a job, you're taking that job away from them. When in Mm. reality, the brands that are paying you have probably got enough money to pay quite a lot of creators. So Mm -hmm. there is more than enough work to go around. And we all as creators need to get over this kind of like, if they've got it, then I haven't, because there's it's unlimited. Like, there's so much work out there. We're all okay. And I think the panic needs to just, like, calm. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yes. I absolutely agree with that. And like you said, with this abundance mindset, actually having a bit more self-belief, because we spend so much time on our own. I know you have Joel to do your duo stuff, but we do ultimately spend a lot of time on our own in our own headspace that it can get sometimes lonely and once you do start to believe that you can you can do it you can make it your full-time job you can work with these brands actually I do believe in sort of the law of attraction and all of that sort of stuff whether you do or don't but the more I've noticed that I'm more positive and I do action what I say I'm going to do I do get the rewards for that and I don't know if it's because I actually also have a bit of a career background in marketing and social media as well that's helped me because I do recognize that you know signing with a management company is perfect for somebody who absolutely hates admin hates outreach doesn't want to do all the negotiation side of things but what I quite like as part of this business is not only the creative side I'm like very much 60% of the time creating but Mm. I love the 40% business where I get the lead. I I see through the campaign from start to finish. I negotiate it. I read the contract. I create the 
content for the campaign and then we see the rewards for it and see how many people I don't know bought the product or how many views it got and then they're Mm. so pleased and proud that they then rebook with me and I see the whole thing through again and to me that's a really exciting part of being a creator so not only do I get the rewards of like my community loving what I do but the brands are also so proud and that's where I get my like buzz is I've got like a nice balance of it if that makes sense no totally that's that's so worth it and and also I think you learn different skills when you have to go back to a brand that are trying to offer you next to nothing to do a job and you go actually um my fee for this is blah 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 and then you say you're worth and you're willing to actually walk away from something that's like a really disrespectful fee. You're like, actually, I don't need that. And I think that you learn a lot in that sort of process. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I love the businessy side of it as well. I feel like, yeah, your background in marketing would have definitely helped with that because there's a lot of creators out there that don't know what they're worth. I mean, look at all these people on TikTok with millions of followers that are doing brand deals for like 30 quid. Like, what are you doing, guys? Like, you're ruining it for all of us. You don't know your worth. <laughs> I know it's so hard but until you have creative friends that are willing and open to talk to you about their fees and how much they're charging like I know you and I've had those conversations before and I would never be afraid to tell you oh you know unless it was obviously in a contract that I couldn't talk about but if we were trying to negotiate a fee with somebody I'd be like well you know I charge this amount for an Instagram and this for the stories and whatever it's really helpful to know what people that are similar to you are doing and how much they're charging because how are you meant to know it's a fairly new industry um and like you say I've turned down so much work because I believed that there'd be something else or something more suited to me and it's Mm. been too easy to do jobs that are obvious that I don't love the product or obvious that they don't Mm. align with me and my because I'm a brand at the end of the day which was something I found really difficult to get my head around when your job is your life your life is your job yeah Oregon Tate is technically the brand I found that really hard to like you know figure out but yeah I'm really proud of my the brands I get to work with and the stuff I get to do and like you said there's so much out there now I feel like we're only just getting started with them influencer marketing stuff brands are coming up everywhere like even last week I worked with a really small company that had never worked with a creator before and they didn't have a contract so they'd never worked with um, anyone before and so I went back and forth with them and I said look let's dip your toes into this let's just do some stories I'll do them at this reduced fee for you because I really want you to see the benefit of influencer marketing. And I love the product so much already that we're gonna be a perfect match. We gave Mm. it a go, they loved it so much. They came back and said, okay, not only did you bring us this amount of sales, we really loved the content you produced. All of our teams thought it was brilliant. And you've taught us so much about the steps the to work with someone. Yeah. So they've now booked me in again for a grid post on Instagram. And I was just so yeah, happy with that. Yeah, um, nice. But at the same time, it's like epic when a brand like, for example, I worked with EE recently and Disney and they come for and they're like, oh, we want to work with you. And I'm like, little old me, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so honoured. Like I honestly fangirl and I have to stop myself in my emails from all the exclamation marks because I'm so excited. <laughs> So, oh my god you know. that's like me like now that I talk to brands and sign off my own emails sometimes I'm like Leah why have you put eight kisses on the end like what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> I just like hold down the x I just go like and then send just so they know you know I'm really passionate <laughs> anyway yeah. <laughs> um yeah what you're saying as well about the law of attraction is I'm totally yeah I believe in that 100 million percent and it was only the other day when I saw Shu you know Shu Deja Shu um, mm-hmm. another creative friend of ours and, and she said gosh Leah I'm just so excited I'm so excited because if this is where we are now just imagine where we're going to be in a couple of years if this is what like this is how good it is right now and it made me it sort of snapped me out of a little bit of a negative state I was in and I was like actually no I need to be in more of that frame of mind because if you're constantly expecting things to just get better then they will if mm-hmm. that makes sense and I yeah. think it's, it's very easy it's very easy to go oh no, is this going to keep paying my bills for a long time? Or do I need to, you know, and I have definitely been in that state of panic. It's not good. It's just not it. You've got to stay. Law of attraction on the, I always say like you've got to be a little bit deluded. Just a tiny bit, just a tiny bit deluded. And good things start happening, I think. (laughs) 
Well, it's so fascinating because when I was sort of, sort of trying to build and grow my channel and I left my full-time job and I went part-time and I was really, you know, nothing ever happened overnight for me. A lot of people mm. told me two things. One, I would never make it. And I'd say that in quotation because uh, everyone's definition of success is different. But people say to me, you'd never make it as like a full-time creator earning the same salary you made in your marketing manager role. Uh, if you don't hit 100,000 and if you don't live near London and they were two areas that I just found so fascinating because I was like, well, I'm not hitting subscribers <laughs> quickly and I'm nowhere near London. Well, I'm two hours. I'm based in Bournemouth. And yeah. so it was actually my friend Grace, Grace Victory, who I'm sure you know, but Grace is an incredible creator. You should 100% go and see her channels and her story. But um, she said to me, like, if you just keep coming to your channel, showing up, making the content and believing in yourself enough you will get to where you want to be. It's just, you have to keep taking the steps forward. And it was her believing that I could actually do it, even despite those things that people said I needed to have, that mm. I just just kept trying. But I know that you found the same, not living in London. Did you, did you ever find that, like, stopped your opportunities or...? In fact... I was terrified to leave London. So I, you know, I got into a new relationship and it sort of came to the point where I wanted to move in together. And our options were a tiny little studio flat in London where we, you know, we'd be paying through the roof for it. And my boyfriend would have had to commute like an hour and a half to two hours every day just to get to his nine to five. And I would have just been in London because this is where the events are. And I was yeah. like, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, that's just going to make us miserable. So I moved down to Chichester he stayed close to his job and I found a new place and it actually opened up a lot of opportunities for me. Um, loads of things became available to me. In fact, locally, people were like, wow, this, what do you do? Like, people were really interested. Whereas being, you know, quote unquote, an influencer in London, there's nothing new, nothing special there. You're just like everybody else mm. kind of, uh, you know, you sort of get caught up in, in a group of, you're just not that different. And I actually found yeah. that moving away was probably the best thing I could have done. Um, so I do sometimes get a little bit of FOMO um, when there's events that I just definitely can't make it to. But I'm actually trying to be a bit bougie, bro. And what I'm trying to do is <laughs> I might just I might just book a hotel sometimes if I've got an event that I really want to yeah. go to, even if that's not a paid gig. And I just it's a really cool thing if there's an event I really want to go to and I can justify the inexp the expense of having a hotel, then I. And I do it and I feel great yeah. for it. And it's like a little holiday then. Yeah, I agree with you. I love the traveling side of my job. And before the pandemic, I was going into London like once a week, sometimes every yeah. fortnight, but regularly. And I think some of the brands and events would really appreciate the effort I made. Like it is a lot of effort for me to come up, not only the expense of that, but the time. And so yeah. showing up and being there and making that connection um, was more than just enjoying the event. It was everything was obviously like a networking business opportunity um, or content and being able to go and see, I don't know, the latest this film before it comes out being able to talk about that because my audience want to know these things so it was you have to really weigh out if it's worth your time going all the way there but yeah for me being in Bournemouth is like you've been a really good thing for me I've had opportunities that brands like to see me by the sea and want yes. to see content down here and I recently worked with Visit England and they sent us to London so they obviously couldn't work with a London creator because that yes. wouldn't have worked so yes, you know I cool. I get those sort of opportunities. I'm so glad I sort of didn't listen to the people that said, hey, this is the recipe to become a full-time YouTuber. You've got to do this, 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 and this. Because mm -hmm. honestly, Leah, I did none of it. Absolutely none of it. And look at me, I'm here <laughs> now. And it's my job. And I remember, yes. I think it was 2018 or 19, I remember I'd saved enough money for the mortgage deposit of our house. And I, at that moment, was like, wow. Like, I, I'm doing something right. And then my accountant told me my figures for the year, obviously how much tax I needed to pay. And I had made more <laughs> money in my YouTube job than my mm. marketing manager role full time at a 60 hour week job. I couldn't wow. believe it. It was such an amazing feeling that I had been able to transition like that because I did go from like the full-time jobs. I worked for the big corporate companies. I worked for the smaller companies. I worked yeah. my way up the career ladder and took that route. And I had that moment where I was like, I'm going to have to leave my part-time self-employed 20 hours a week that I'm doing 
to go and make videos full time. And I couldn't quite believe it was happening for me. I just, I still now pinch myself. I'm like <laughs> crazy. <laughs> That's, and I think back to the law of attraction, that is the trick. If you continue to stay really grateful and really like, don't take it for granted, then I think you're more likely to continue to have all of this you know, work come your way and all these opportunities and success. Because I think the moment you start to go like, mm, <laughs> I just get paid, then I feel yeah. like the universe will throw some shit at you and be like, ah, take this. Here's a month of yeah. no views, hun, or something like that. But yeah, so I, I love all of that. And I just wondered, whilst you were talking about your old jobs, did you do a gradual transition or did you literally throw yourself in the deep end and going, right, I'm going to go do this? Yeah, no, it was gradual. So I was working full time, I started as the social media manager, worked my way up to the marketing manager for an iced coffee company. And it was a really intense job, but I learned a lot there. I learned a lot about the other side, which has been beneficial for me as a creator because I now massively understand marketing budgets, how PRs work, and it was good for me. But at the same time, it was a very demanding job. I not only had full control of marketing side of things, but I was sort of the... PA to the MD so I did a lot of admin and running around I was going to like festivals and selling iced coffee out of a van but also doing the social media 24 7 and it was quite a lot I actually found it it went from being an amazing career and like a dream job for me to wow this is way too intense too much pressure too much on me I can't do this and I've got no life so I actually left that job without another job ready and I know that and I recognize that that was quite a bold move but also the privilege I was in to be able to afford at least a month or two I knew I had a little bit of leeway before I needed Mm. desperately another job and Mm. those two sort of months I had I I basically got to live the full-time YouTuber life for the first time ever and I loved it so much I loved the freedom the flexibility but I wasn't earning enough money to pay my bills I lived in a flat by myself and I knew I needed something else and Mm. through you know years and years and years of connections I actually had a WhatsApp group with some local Bournemouth bloggers and we still talk to this day although most of us aren't blogging at all in fact I don't think any of them are but they're all um, amazing badass women and some of them are a little bit older than me and they some of them are like digital nomads and they really sort of um, pushing the boundaries of what used to be just career traditional job roles and they were showing that you can go and do all sorts of stuff and one of them actually sent me the link to a part-time social media manager role and it just fit perfectly went to the interview got the job it was it was a weird one because I worked uh, as a self-employed person so I would invoice the company for my time my boss was like um, a bit a business woman herself and uh, she was so Uh, empowering and positive and she loved that I had my channel on the side and we just had a really good working relationship for at least a year just over a year and it got to a point where she said okay I need you to come on either full-time or I can't keep sustaining this like part-time thing we're doing here because I need Mm -hmm. someone full-time hours and it was at that point I had to make the decision do I go down the career route again or do I take my channel full time? So I did. I just wow. believed that I could do it. And I was earning good money. I left my management as well. So I made a lot of choices. And my boyfriend, Benji, and I had been together about a year at the time. His family let me move into their house so I could save a little bit. So all the stars aligned. It was the universe yeah. saying, hey, you got this. It's your time now. Um, yes. And it, nice. yeah, I've been doing it like seven years. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I think I can do it. Yeah. Um, but I, for the first year, I kept saying, do you know what? I kept saying to Benj, it doesn't matter. I can always go and get a job in a coffee shop or mm. at the supermarket. If I need the extra hours, it's no problem. And then the months kept going and the work kept coming and I kept surprising myself. And so here I am. Yeah, nice. So yeah, celebrating the 10 years. It was my full time thing. And it's mad. It's, mad. it's absolutely mad. Yeah. But um, hey, I'm really glad I had those opportunities, you know, because it taught me a lot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, she just took Jenny from the block. She knows where she came from. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> love that for well, you. I, I do. I, love, I loved having the corporate jobs with the uh, colleagues and that life because 
I can compare it and then I'm even more grateful because I can see the pros and cons, the highs and lows, because like every job, there are highs and lows. And I think the only difference with being a creator is that our highs and lows are extreme. So we have extreme mm. highs and very extreme lows, dark side to the internet, which I, you know, a lot of people know the sort of things mm -hmm. and struggles we have to go through. So I think that's the only major difference is that in the past being in a corporate job, I'd have, I don't know, company perks and you know, sick pay and holiday pay and whatnot. But the downside might be a bit stressful, colleagues that were difficult to work with, you yeah. know, whatever. Um, but I was very much in that little bubble when I shut the door and left for the day. That was it. I left my work at home. And now, yeah. obviously, trying to get that balance between my online and offline life and yeah. trying to get my own jobs in is way harder than my full-time marketing manager job, but way more rewarding. Um, yeah. So... It's just a completely different world. And I think you have to be a certain type of person to have the motivation to, um, well, yeah, to be self-motivated to do this job because it is yeah. sometimes challenging. And to sustain it for same. that many years and to just keep going for that long, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people just sort of stop. They just go, I can't do this anymore. And then I don't really know what they end up doing for like money. But a loads of people just end up just going, no, I can't, I can't handle this. So, hmm. you know, kudos for just carrying on through everything, the highs, the lows. It is hard. And, uh, you know, people love to hate influencers. People absolutely love to just hate anybody who's got a, I don't know, I feel like you, it is a privilege, but also you've worked really, really, really hard to build this. So it's like people will always have a problem with someone who's got an audience or a platform or a voice. How do you cope with that well I think it used to be that certain amount of subscribers you didn't really get much hate or yeah. trolling or negativity but actually that's gone out the window these days because I have friends that have got like 2,000 subscribers and mm -hmm. they're even getting criticism and I think the line is so like thin between what's constructive and mm. what is just abuse and trolling harassment bullying like it's it's very 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 hard emotionally very draining but I have learned a lot along the way and there have been moments that people have called me out or educated me but I also think there's immense pressure as creators to, that we're put on this pedestal to talk about everything mm. all the time world events and it can go the other way and be de damaging if you start talking about things you're not educated in yeah. and so I recognize having a platform is is amazing and having that amount of people watching or you know following but you have you do have this level of responsibility and you have to use it right and um yeah you have to sort of check in with yourself every now and again and, and what are your morals what are the things you want to talk about what what is your platform because I'm not um, an activist and I don't know I am happy to admit I don't know everything and I can't be that spokesperson I'm sure yeah. you feel the same people yeah, sure. expect us to talk about it all don't they and it's hard I think it's really hard I think you know when I was getting messages going why aren't you talking about Palestine I went well I'm not a news outlet am I I'm not yeah what, yeah what, what do you think I am and I yeah. shared something I shared something on my story about the village in Cyprus that my family are from where it was on fire it was a huge fire and people had died and people's homes were burned and people were like funny how you care about this and not Palestine and I was like sorry this is really close to home for me and I mm. I just you know you can't win you'll never please everyone um so I just did what everyone else does delete the story and just god just hope to bury my head in the sand and go god why do I even bother like <laughs> what yeah. is the point um yeah but I think you know when you kind of go there's more people that love what I'm here for than than what dislike what, you know what I'm trying to say. It's more people that love me yeah. than, what hate, than what hate me. So I just got to focus on the people that are there for the good times and um, disregard the rest. And I, I think ignorance is bliss. I actually ignore, like I've got blocks, I've got filters on. I don't go read any horrible forums. I literally just stay in my ignorant bubble and just ignore... <laughs> I love it. I love that about you. You're so it. much more carefree and uh, yeah, sort of, you don't let the emotions take over too much, which is something I'm working on because I'm quite emotional and things upset me deeply and I get really, um, yeah, well, emotional about it. 
But yeah. I think there's also the assumption that just because you don't talk about things doesn't mean you're not doing the work and educating yourself offline. And yeah. uh, and then you get critiqued for then performative activism if you do talk about things. If you yeah. don't, you're seen as like not caring. So there is no right or wrong. There is like, you you will never please everybody. And like you say, it's, it's about just focusing on the majority and not the minority because that you know, it's, it's so easy for people to misinterpret things and words and it's really upsetting especially yes. when you definitely didn't mean something and then it was taken totally out of context um yeah. I find that really difficult to like try and defend myself and then I make it worse so it is something I am working on I think having a bit of therapy recently has been good for me talking about it with my creative friends offline and having Laura there to manage things but like you I have a lot of blocked words and I'm not afraid of that I have every single comment on my YouTube channel I've actually got in a held for review which means that whenever anybody comments I have to read it and accept or delete it before it goes public and that and I also turned off the likes and dislikes uh, about yeah. a year and a half ago because there were people that were disliking the video within seconds of it going live and using bots and stuff and somebody at YouTube said to me like oh no it's good for you to keep the likes and dislikes on and I said but it's making me feel bad like if you yeah. just had likes as an option that would be great but also they said well that that's not helpful either because people like to see if the video has been disliked so I just said you know what I'm gonna turn them off so yeah. I did and I never looked back I don't care how many views my video how many likes sorry my video gets or dislikes I just don't look at it because it's not there yeah. anymore I don't see it so yeah I sort of made my own rules and that's how I want to manage my channel and some people might not agree with it but that's how I their boundaries that I've set and I'm I'm pleased about that. Yeah, no, for sure. And like you said earlier, you are your brand. You you are your business. If you choose to just not have that tool switched on because mm. it's not serving you, then good for you. Get rid. Yeah. Um, Bye. I don't. I don't think I've ever even. I, I'm. I'm totally like. I'm really bad at analytics. I don't think I've even looked at likes, dislikes ever. Um, I don't genuinely don't think I, I have. I just. I think I, obviously I've looked at views, comments. Um, my question on the comments was, do you then manually do the comments or do you have a community manager that goes through and approves the comments? I have had people help me in the past, but at the moment I do it all myself. So yeah. it is something that if I were to have somebody come on like self-employed part-time, that would be one of the things I would like yeah. somebody to take over. Um, but yeah, right now I approve everything and read it all and it means that I get to read everything so even if I don't reply to everything I see everything and I think my audience are grateful for that they they know it, that they're they're being seen and heard um but yeah the YouTube are quite good now and they have loads of blocked words so stuff doesn't even get into the held for review even if you use a block word I don't even see it at all um and that's just made my space so much more positive and I'm grateful for that Instagram's the same so yeah oh, nice it's just well done love yeah, that it's, it's hard it's yeah. hard <laughs> But you know what? Like you've you've come so far. I'm so excited for for where it's going to go for you. And um, uh, yeah, I, I look forward to just following you more on your journey. You're honestly an inspiration to, to loads of us. And I, I I do stand by what I said. I, I see you as a huge influencer. I don't see you as a micro influencer at all. Shut so up. <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks for coming no, on. I Oh, thank you for having me. I absolutely love, vice versa, same for you. I love seeing everything you're doing. I honestly have no idea how you manage so many channels, so many pages, so much content. And um, and I love it all. So um, thank you. no, I'm really excited to see what, what you and you and Joel do uh, equally respectfully. So uh, yeah, it's just it's just cool, cool time, isn't it? So thank you for having me. It's like, been a no lovely worries. chat. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that episode, everyone. I really enjoy sitting down with Brogan, having a chat with her. She's absolutely brilliant. And don't forget, you can check out all of her links in the show notes, especially her podcast, The Online Offline, which she is co-hosting with Bianca, her best friend, all about navigating the highs and lows of adulthood. So definitely check it out. And before you go, don't forget to like and subscribe. Follow me on platforms and leave reviews if you can. Reviews really help. Um, take care and see you in the next one. Bye. Chats, chats, chats with Leah. Hats, hats, hats. What are you saying then?